All right, so in this one, we're going to talk about, this is our first survey of the species section. So what we're going to do from here on for, uh, for this unit is we're going to go through and look at each of the different um, phyla. We're going to look at the different classes. We're going to look at the different organisms. Uh, we're going to have our dissections coming up, which I have to figure out how we can do with COVID regulations. I'm working on it, trying to figure it out. I'm not really sure how we're going to do it. But we have all these interesting phyla that we're going to go through. You will be required to know certain things about each one. All right, so what you're going to need to know. You need to know about the adaptations. Remember, adaptations are what we've been talking about, about the whales and things, how their body is designed to live where they live. I'm looking for body parts, okay? Adaptations. Know how to classify them based on the characteristics of the phyla. So you need to know the characteristics of each phyla. What makes them that group? Why did we put them there? All right, and then know the special characteristics for each class. So notice we're, com we're combining the information that you learned last time. We're combining all the information about taxonomy, your anatomical terms, your evolution ideas, and your adaptation ideas. We're combining all those to go through into a survey of the species. So you can see the various uh, phyla in the ocean. All right, so the first one we're going to talk about, there's a lot of different ways you can classify animalia, all right? So these are all in the kingdom, Animalia. There's a lot of different ways you can look at it. Remember when we did the taxonomy lab with all those pictures and you had to move everything around? Well, there's a lot of different ideas on how to classify them, but the two classic ways are invertebrates and vertebrates. Invertebrates, there's no true phyla or group called invertebrates. What they are is multiple phyla that don't have a vertebra don't have that vertebral column, that bony column. And there is a phylum vertebrata, but not an in invertebrates because there's so many different groups. Remember when you make your groups that it's kind of hard to have one overlying one. And so in invertebrates, you're going to notice there's multiple phyla and in vertebrata, there's subphyla. So it's a little bit weird how we classify the kingdom animalia. But we're going to start with the invertebrates because those are the ones that are the easiest to understand because they're what we call simple. When you watch that Ed puzzle, are simple animals dumb? Nope. No. It just means their body is less complex. Does it mean they can't do complex things? No. They can still provide, you know, food. They can reproduce. They can do all the same things that we can Maybe not higher order thinking, but who are we to say that? We don't even know yet. All right, so the first one we're going to talk about are Cnidaria. It starts with a C, okay? But it's uh, it pronounces Cnidaria. The C is silent because of English, and it's stupid. All right, but it returns from the Latin nide, meaning nettle. Uh, do you know what a stinging nettle is? Okay, a nettle is uh, the word for stinging. So... Kind of makes sense. What do you think these uh, these all have? <laughs> they all will sting you. All of them. All right, so they're sometimes called, every once in a while, you'll hear their older name. So their older name is colenterates. Colenterates um, are the other name for Nidaria. They're like AKA. It's an older name. It depends on what professor you have in college when you finally get to there. If you're taking a zoology class, it's not zoology, it's zoology. Um, but zoology class, they're gonna, they may or may not call it col colenterates or nideria. It's known as both. It's like a nickname versus it. But it just means hollow gut. These are the four, um, I'm sorry, the five different classes of Nigeria, we're going to go through and do an example species from most of these, and we're going to talk about each different class. But first, let's talk about what are the characteristics of Nigeria. All right, so the characteristics, these are the characteristics you need to know. They have two cell layers, uh, an apidermis, a gastrodermis, and in between, it's a very lightweight, um, almost like an air-filled Spot, but it's not just air, it's like really light. It helps them float. It's called the mesoglea. That's why jellyfish float, is because of the mesoglea. 
their stinging tentacles. That is the number one characteristic for this phyla. They all have stinging tentacles. Uh, they have a sac-like digestive system. There isn't really a whole lot going on there. It's just an, uh, what they call an invagination. Radial symmetry, because they're symmetrical in multiple directions at once. Their tentacles are always arranged in a circle around the mouth, always. And a nerve net. So a nerve net is not a brain, but it's like a ring of nervous tissue cells. They're very primitive, but they do serve a nervous function. And they're invertebrates, obviously no bones, none. All right, so Nidarians, the defining characteristic, again, it has to have stinging cells. And so that original ancestor had to have stinging cells. So this is a sea anemone here. And that sea anemone is, you remember Nemo, right? That's what he lived in, the stinging cells of the sea anemone. There's also jellyfish, which you're familiar with. And the coral. A lot of people don't realize that jellyfish and coral are in the same phyla. You ever been like coral snorkeling? If you haven't, you really should go, it's gorgeous. Okay, so coral is generally thought of as being hard, like stony. But what's unique about coral is that it's actually stony, part of it is the skeleton. The actual animal itself is soft like a jellyfish and it lives like around it, in it, through it. So we're going to show you these. All right, so you need to know these four classes. Oops. So the four classes of cnidarians. So you have the non-moving anthrozoa. And in Latin, it turns to literally amper as flower, zoa, animal. So it's like flower animals. But if you think about sea anemones, don't they kind of look like flowers? That's where their name comes from. Cubozoa is the box jellyfish because it's literally a cube, so that would make sense. Um, the traditional jellyfish that you all think of is Skyphosa, and that's like the regular old jellyfish with the little, you know, the head and the tentacles hanging down. And um, sky foza is cup animals, which would make sense because don't they look like an upside down cup? And then hydrozoa, which is a really weird group that includes the hydra, um, the Portuguese man of war, the crazy, crazy guys are in the hydrozoa. So they're very unique uh, classes. There are about 10,000 different species of cnidaria. There's a lot of them in here, quite a few. If you've ever been swimming in the ocean, you probably unfortunately came around some of these here in Florida. All right, so that you need to know the taxon taxonomic organization of cnidarians. They're always in the kingdom Animalia. They are in the phylum cnidaria. And then you have the four classes, the anthrozoa, the cubozoa, the, uh, the skyphozoa, and the hydrozoa. All right, so we're looking at this section here, Nigeria. All right, so the first one we're going to talk about are coral. All right, so corals are sessile. So what does sessile mean? Sessile means they do not get up and walk around. A sessile animal does not move. All right, so they just sit around. Uh, they are permanently attached to the ocean floor in some way. They do have stinging cells. I got um, tangled up in a bunch of fire coral when I was about 12. And, oh, God, I will never forget how miserable I was for about a week. Um, I was snorkeling and got in some really shallow water. And I got fire coral all down my belly. And fire coral are... Um, like abnormally bad stings compared to normal coral. 
and oh, I was swollen and huge, my whole belly, everything, my face, I got it all over because I panicked and stood up like an idiot. So I was good, I didn't know. But I got covered in fire coral stings and it was miserable for about a week, I was blistered everywhere, but they do sting quite badly. Uh, most of them don't sting that bad, but fire coral tends to be pretty rough. Um, radially symmetrical, because again, they are radially symmetrical in their polyps. Now, a lot of kids look at this and they're like, that is not radially symmetrical. Those coral pieces look like they are asymmetrical. But if you look at a single polyp, so you have to zoom in and one polyp, they're all radially symmetrical. So if you looked at one little piece of this coral and you zoomed way far in, it actually looks like this. Each one has these stinging cells. Each one looks like that. They're small. All right, so when you look at a coral, what you're really looking at is thousands and thousands of tiny coral polyps that are living together in a community. One head is millions of coral polyps, lots. Each individual coral itself is different than, uh, some of them will be, most of them are the same on the same coral. Uh, they can be uh, asexual or sexual. They have unique reproduction. Uh, but when you're looking at a coral head, you're actually looking at thousands of animals. All right, so most of them are not thicker than a nickel. They secrete this limestone that makes their skeleton, their community skeleton, hard. So I've got some coral, a big coral head here to show you. So this is a coral head, just right there in the front. So this is a coral head, guys. And if you look, every single one of these little tiny indentations, these itty bitty dots, is where one of the polyps was. This is just their skeleton. And year after year, they produce more and more and more of this limestone. This is an actual rock, but it's a rock that's made by an animal, which sounds really crazy. All right, so this limestone is the same limestone that Florida sits on. We're what we call a karst region, K-A-R-S-T. So that's why places like, um, you know, we have that phosphate mining down in Mayo, Occidental, we have all of these things. It's because we're living, sitting on an old ocean floor where there was shallow water and they had a coral reef. We're literally sitting on ancient, ancient million year old coral reefs. And that's this limestone. That's the stuff that you, you know, can dig out of the ground. So this is an actual coral head. And there's a lot, this is a stony coral. So when they die, more and more go on top and on top and on top. And then you wind up with this giant coral head. Now they can get huge, way bigger than even this one. But just remember, there's multiple, multiple things that you're looking at. Thousands of polyps in one single coral that you would see here. There'd really be no way to count all of these. It'd be crazy. All right, so the first class we're going to talk about is anthrozoa. Anthrozoa, these are the coral polyps that excrete this calcium carbonate. This is this hard substance you see here. This is what makes up limestone. This is why Florida is this karst region. This is why we are sitting on a dead sea. And we can tell you this because I can dig in the ground and find these coral rocks. Because that was not made 
by the earth that was made by the animals that live on it. Which is weird, isn't it? It's weird to think that a rock was made by an animal. All right, so corals are these colonial animals. They are animals. And they make up larger structures. The largest one in the entire world is the Great Barrier Reef. It's located off the northeastern coast of Australia. It's larger than the United States going from Washington State all the way down to Mexico. It's that big of a coral reef. Um, a lot of the kids don't realize that, yes, we do have corals here in Florida. Where would you find a coral reef here in Florida? The Keys, right? Well, obviously the water. But the Keys actually are the one of the northernmost tropical reefs. And you can actually go to the Florida Keys and see these coral reefs. There is. It's a deep water reef. It's a different type of reef. It's a cold water reef. They're not as pretty. Yes, it is a coral reef, but it's not as pretty. It's just a different type. All right, but the largest one is the Great Barrier Reef. It is enormous, and it is in Australia. Uh, the Great Bar Barrier Reef is in great peril right now. Um, over 70% of it is dying or dead already. Unfortunately, um, it's... it's has a lot of major issues. We're gonna talk about those in just a little bit. All right, but these coral reefs are huge. 134,000 square miles, it's enormous. All right, so corals themselves, you need to know how they're structured. So they're, the coral polyp is soft bodied. All right, it's actually an animal that relies on a symbiotic relationship. So each one of these little tiny animals that used to live on this skeleton had algae that lived in their tissues. It's called zoanthellae. That's that zoo word. All right, so sometimes you'll hear me call them zoans, zoanthellaes. If you want to win Scrabble, that is the word to use. My God, it is a great word for that. All right, but these are just the tiny pieces of algae, these little tiny animals that are living within and inside these other animals, the polyps. So they live in their cells. And if you look on the um, description here, it's trying to show you that with these little yellow dots on these tentacles. And inside the tissue itself is these zoans. All right, so these zoanthellae are tiny little microorganisms. And what they do is they feed the plant. And they're just algae. All right, so a lot of kids are like, why should I give a crap about coral reefs, okay? There's a lot of reasons why you should care about coral reefs. Uh, corals, are super important, especially for Florida, because our Florida Keys are a huge tourist destination. All right, but they provide food sources. They are the ultimate food source in the ocean. It's like the rainforest of the ocean. There's so many animals that call the reef home. That's where we do all of our fishing. That's why Esmeralda, Florida is the capital of fishing in the entire world. It's because of the coral reef situations that we have. We're unique. Food source of so many organisms, food source for us. A massive amount of biodiversity on the reef. It's the uh, excellent fishing. Florida is the number one fishing capital of the world, guys. We are it, and it is because of our coral reefs, and we don't even have that many of them left. All right, but they allow for tourism, they increase our global economy, both locally and globally. Without the coral reefs, we have a massive decrease in the amount of money and funding available. There is a couple of downsides, though. If you've ever been to the Keys, you know that treasure hunting is a thing, right? The reason why treasure hunting is a thing is because these coral reefs can be deadly to ships. They're hard, aren't they? They're stony. Some are very sharp. They can actually cut holes. The problem with the Great Barrier Reef is it sits in one of the largest shipping lanes in the world. 
It is the main shipping lane coming from Asia, which is huge, to the rest of the world. Problem, if you're shipping stuff all the way through those coral reefs, it's very hard to get a large ship through. They will cut their hull. They can leak oil. They can ground ships. Ground ship means that it's like it's stuck, kind of like a stuck truck and it can't go anywhere. All right, but they can cause a lot of issues. This is a tanker. This photo is a tanker. And it's showing you this was uh, this is a tanker, an oil tanker that ran aground on a reef here in the Philippines. That's a big deal because oil kills all the corals, right? So we have a big issue with do we want to continue doing the global traffic? Do we want to save the reef? There's you can't do both together. All right, so corals come in a whole bunch of different sizes and types. You're going to need to know these basic types. And they're pretty obvious. This one is a brain coral. I wonder why. Looks like a brain. We didn't go out on the limb here to name this one. And this one over here is, it has so much variation in what they look like that you can have soft or stony. So stony corals are made of limestone. Okay, they form these massive structures like this. This is a stony coral, or was before it's obviously dead and long gone. All right, so brain, we have staghorn, and we have star corals. So I try and give you the corals that we have here in Florida. So if you look, stony corals, now look carefully. Do you see all of these little polyps? That's what these would have looked like on this, um, on this big stony coral here. That's what they would look like. So the underlying skeleton looks like that, but it's covered with living tissue when it's alive. And each of them has tiny little tentacles. You can see them, they're little. All right, so we have these different types of stony corals. We have brain coral, staghorn, and star. What was this one? What do you think this guy is? See the brain coral. Wait, which this one. Does it look like a brain coral? Does it look like staghorn? Does it look like, you know, horny? No. It is. It's a star. This is a star coral. Smart. All right, so what type of coral is this one? Brain, definitely, right? Clearly a brain coral. All right, so then you have soft corals. So I don't have a skeleton of a soft coral because they don't have stony skeletons. What they have is they're fibrous. They're more like the jellyfish kind, right? They don't have a stone skeleton like the stony squirrel, uh, coral. They don't excrete limestone. They're more fibrous, which gives them flexibility. So that means if I'm diving in the ocean, the fibrous soft coral is going to be moving and whipping. It'll still be attached to the ground, but it's not going to be sitting there like a, you know, a stone. All right, so they're going to appear to look more like a plant than you would think. They sway back and forth with the waves. And they're kind of like moving. This one always reminds me of like broccoli. Doesn't it kind of look like broccoli to you? Just like a pink purpley broccoli. All right, but what it is is these are sea fans, whips, plume coral. These are all corals. They do have stone. If you look at the bottom of them where they're attached to the ground, they do produce a stony attachment to the ground, but that's it. They don't do any of the same types that we do. And what's unique is each one of these is individual still. They're what we call colonial organisms. They share a main body, but each individual one is individuals, which is unique. So 
So you have three types of corals that are soft. You have sea fans, which are kind of obvious because they look like fans. Whips, which, I mean, self-explanatory. And plumes, which come from one spot. So when if I ask you to uh, decide which one each one is, the best thing to do is the fan's pretty obvious, the whip's pretty obvious, the plume you may get mixed up with a stony coral. That's the only one that you could get mixed up. And the one that you get it mixed up with is the staghorn. But what I want you to do is look at the bottoms, okay? If it attaches in one place only, it's a plume. If it's large at the base and it's like kind of can't tell that it's off of a stalk, then it's definitely a stony. It's hard to tell from photographs. And unfortunately, I don't have a soft coral to show you without, you know, having an actual tank in here. Uh, because if they die, they're, they're dead. They're not, there's nothing left of them like this one. All right, so what type of coral is this? Is she right? Is it the whip? It looks like it because it's skinny. It is very skinny. What do you think, guys? Well, is it a fan one? No, it doesn't look like a fan at all. Is it a um, the plume? Does it look like trees? No, it's actually a whip. If you look, it's just one long strand. That's a whip. Yep, she's smart. They can be really long. Now, they do break, right, because they're soft. So, like, if they get a really hard, um, you know, like, bad wa waves and things, because they're in shallower water. Yeah, sadly. All right, but almost all corals are called colonial organisms. You're actually looking at thousands and thousands of organisms that are working together, even the ones on the plumes and the whips and things like that. There are thousands of organisms that just kind of share a main body. All right, that means that they're composed of a lot. Each polyp has a stomach and a mouth and tentacles. That's about it. There isn't a whole lot more to them. So if you, this is one that has been cut in half. So if you're looking at it, it's been a polyp that has been sliced down the middle. So it is a transverse cut through him. His mouth is in the center of the tentacles as always. They all have a mouth that is center of the tentacles because the tentacles feed it. So these are opportunistic animals. They just sit around and uh, they catch plankton and they put it in the mouth and that's it. It digests in this sac-like cavity and then it basically poops out the waste out of its mouth. Doesn't have an anus or anything. The waste is just regurgitated back out onto the surface, which is kind of gross. All right, but food enters the stomach through the mouth, waste is expelled through the mouth. So it's the same as that. And all the polyps are connected with living tissue. All of them are connected on the surface. So there's a layer. If you look, there's that layer of green. That layer is the entire surface. This would have been covered in not only individual polyps, but all the polyps would have been connected by a living layer. It would have been soft on the outside, hard in the middle, if that makes any sense. All right, so each one of these indentations, these holes, is called the costae. And it's where it was attached at the base. It just looks like more and more and more. They're just layered on here. So like as it gets older, it just lays more and more and more limestone down. So if you look, they're just layers and layers of these costae that just keep going up, 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 all the way through. They're just longer. All right, but these costae are the, in the outside um, the layers of mesoderm, mesoglia, gastrodermis, that's it. That's all he's got. There isn't a whole lot to it. All right, so I give you a link to this where you're going to label the coral anatomy. So if you click on that, as long as you stay on Canvas, you should be able to click through 
and say all of the pieces of the anatomy. So I'm going to let you do that on your own. All right, so the question lies, what is living and what's not? This is obviously not living, right? But it was. So what parts were alive? This corallite is the skeleton, okay? This guy is just a skeleton. What was actually living was all on top of here. It would have been the whole thing soft, with those little polyps coming off of it. This is just the inner workings of it. All right, so all of the skeleton is not living, but the polyp itself would have covered this and made it living. So the corals have this calcium carbonate. And that's important for you to know, CaCO3. Calcium carbonate. That is what your coral skeleton stone, this guy, is made of. It's the same thing that your bones are made of. Your bones are also calcium carbonate, guys. It's the same thing that limestone is made of. You ever seen, uh, if you're a farming family, you'll know what dolomite is. Dolomite is powdered limestone, and we spread it on all these fields. You ever drove by a field and see a huge pile of white dirt? That's limestone that's been crushed, and that's what we put on our fields because it, it helps change the pH of the soil. And pH is a key idea when we get to the ocean chemistry in just a second, and you're going to see why calcium carbonate is uh, used in farming because it changes the pH, whether it be the, the ocean or the soil. All right, the way that they make these skeletons, the, the way that they make this guy, is what they do is they uptake the calcium from the water. They take the carbonate from the water, and they put them together in their body and excrete it out as this hard, white stone. All right, so I give you this little presentation here on how um, they teach you how organisms make the ions found in water to make their shells. And you need to understand how they make the calcium carbonate skeletons. And what is the threat with that rising atmospheric CO2? So if you click on the link, it'll take you there. We're going to talk a little bit more about them. So I'm going to let you do that part on your own as well. So... The big question is, what happens when the carbon dioxide levels are increasing like they are now? Our carbon dioxide that we have been measuring in our atmosphere, we can compare it to frozen core samples from millions of years ago because I can go under the permafrost in Antarctica and I can see and measure the global, uh, what the global climate gases were at the time, and ours are sky high compared to when it was either dinosaurs or around. So what we're finding is that this increase in carbon dioxide has only been around in the last 200 years. That's it. And it started with the Industrial Revolution. And what we're finding is that a lot of the shells from these organisms are already beginning to have issues. Uh, any organism that excretes calcium carbonate or uses calcium carbonate from the ocean. Fish obtain calcium carbonate from the ocean to produce their skeletons. Um, any organism that creates a shell is obviously making that shell out of calcium carbonate. And of course, the corals are making their skeletons as well out of calcium carbonate. And what happens is when you increase carbon dioxide levels in the air, like we are, you wind up with a massive amount of carbon dioxide dissolved in the ocean. Carbon dioxide increases the acidity of the ocean because that carbon dioxide, when it dissolves, is dissolved as carbonic acid. So we have this ocean acidification happening. So it's the changing of our oceans. It has already changed about 30-fold from what it used to be 200 years ago. It is on rise to change another 40 fold in the next 10 years, because it's increasing at a higher rate. 
All right, so excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is the reason why this is happening. So at least a quarter of all the carbon dioxide that's a, that is given off uh, for coal burning. Every time you turn on these lights, guys, we have coal burning stations. Uh, hydroelectric is very small. We do have a hydroelectric plant here. Duke Energy has a hydroelectric plant right there on the Suwannee River, right where we cross over on 90. You just can't see it from the road. But we have a hydroelectric plant there. It's very small, but it does do a tri-county area. Tri-County Electric does not. Tri-County Electric is still a coal burning. You wouldn't figure. We have nuclear power here as well. Off the coast in Carabelle, we have a big nuclear power plant. Uh, it is being decommissioned, however, so it's going away. But every time you turn on the power, every time you use your lights or energy of any kind, you're actually harming the ocean, which you wouldn't figure. And not directly, but indirectly through the emission of carbon dioxide. Uh, every time you drive your car, every time you use any electricity or anything, it's adding to the carbon dioxide. And we've been using so much that in the last 200 years, you've changed the climate of the planet massively already. And it's doing it worse. All right, so what happens is when that carbon dioxide from the gas dissolves, it dissolves as carbonic acid. That carbonic acid alone starts to dissolve shells. But it also stops the amount of calcium that is available in the water that they can put together to make this skeleton. All right, so it's really, really changing. It's impacting shells, making them weak because it's dissolving them. It's in, uh, impacting growth because it's very hard to grow without any of the um, ions around in the water. It impacts their survival because if your shell is not hard or your skeleton is not hard, you are easy to uh, have predators eat you. It impacts their reproductive rates because if there's no calcium around to build skeletons and bones, then there's no babies being born with skeletons and bones. It also lowers the survival of the young. And a lot of this has something to do with pH. Remember I said that we spread the dolomite or the powdered limestone out on the um, ground because it alters the pH of the ground. It also alters the pH of the oceans, and it keeps them basic. Do you know what a base is? I'm sure you've heard of acid, though, right? It's the opposite of acid. Where an acid dissolves and eats things, a base does the same thing, but it doesn't really get the, um, it's just as bad, if not worse, than an acid, but it doesn't get the reputation that the acids get because it's not as pretty. It's not, you know, smoking and making all the big noise about it. All right, for the pH scale, you should remember from elementary or middle school, it goes from 0 to 14, seven's in the middle. The ocean originally should be about 8.2 to 8.4, somewhere in there. Right now, currently, it's already down an entire section. It's already down to 8.1. In places, it's down to 7.4. Depends on where you are in the world. So in the 200 plus years since the, revolu uh, the Industrial Revolution, we have dropped the pH of the entire ocean one logarithmic fold. That is huge and scary. It's only been 200 years. Can you imagine 200 more? There won't be any coral. All right, so if you look at the graph here, the graph is showing you surface pH levels uh, in 1900 as because they were measured in 1900, so that's when we first have recordings of them. And as you go through, you can clearly see the decline as they come down. And this is to, um, by 2100, it's uh, proposed that the entire ocean is gonna be down about 7.6. It's pretty scary because at that rate, there will be no fish. All right, so ocean um, acidification is leading to a major decline in the biodiversity of the marine environment because it's not only going to dissolve all of these skeletons and stop their growth of corals, but corals are the home of so many organisms that if they lose their home, they're open to predation, they're gonna die. So it's not just the corals that are affected, it's literally every single animal in the ocean that would be affected by these. All right, so it leads to fishery collapse. 
Fisheries are important because I love shrimp. Absolutely love them, ate seafood yesterday. My favorite food on earth, don't you take away my shrimp. Please take care of my oceans because I want shrimp. That's literally the only reason. <laughs> All right, but seafood, come on. Favorite food, don't get rid of it. it lowers the biodiversity of the planet, which leads to less uh, and less fish, which means to less genetic diversity, which means we have multiple genetic problems. It lowers our global economy. Most of the coastal uh, cities, are based on fishing. Guys, if you take away the fish, you take away every bit of their, um, there's no more jobs for them. There's no more vacations. Nobody's gonna wanna go to a dead sea, it's kind of ugly. So it lowers tourism. So much more implications than just you no know, shrimp, even though that's my biggest one. All right, so the question is, what can we do? Well, if we increase the number of um, there's some scientists out there uh, who propose, well, why don't we chemically change it back? Just like I spread limestone on my field to increase my pH and make it more basic, I could spread limestone and put it back in the ocean and make it more basic, right? The problem with that is the amount that you would need is astronomical. And besides, we want to use it. <laughs> we keep pumping it out of the oceans, not only with the carbon dioxide issue, but literally we dig it out of the oceans because it's easy to get to. And we use limestone all the time. You ever live down a limestone dirt road? That's been pulled from the ocean or from here because we live in a karst region, we can dig in the ground and find it. But in all the other places on the planet, you can't do that. So we actually use this a lot. And besides the amount that it would take to dump back in there, we, won't, we don't even have that. There's no possible way. So that's not gonna work. Basically the only way that would guarantee work and to be sad about it, it's not gonna work either, is to act on that climate change, to change how much carbon dioxide we put in the air, disclaimer, as a scientist and not as a teacher, I'm going to tell you this is not going to happen. There's no possible way. Are you going to stop driving your vehicle? Are you going to stop turning on the lights? Are we going to stop using, you know, phones and all kinds of crap? Nobody's going to stop doing that. So, I mean, we can say climate change all we want, but good luck with that. Not going to happen. To be honest, it's just not. So what we should prepare you for is the end of the coral reefs because it's where it's going. Even if we stopped producing carbon dioxide now, there's so much carbon dioxide being emitted. Even if we stopped today and didn't produce near another lick, like not one more, we would still have see the extinction of the coral reefs in less than 50 years. Because there's so much already there, it's dissolving into the ocean still. So, I mean, I hate to you know be all rainbows and happy thoughts, but it's not gonna happen. All right, so if we lower our emissions, that's our best option. Stop using gas, stop using coal, stop using oil. Problem is, is we're on an uptick, not a downtick with our using of those things. It's just not really gonna happen. All right, so back to the way that the corals cannot live alone. Coral and Zoans are synonymous with one another. You cannot have coral surviving without zoanthellae, not for very long. They can for about two weeks. That's it. What happens is these zoanthellae are these little tiny pieces of algae. And if you look in this picture up here in the corner, you can see these are the little zoanthellae that the algae that live within the coral itself. They literally live in the tissues, all of the tissues. And the algae use the sunlight because remember reefs are shallow, right? So they use sunlight, they're photosynthetic and they create the oxygen that feeds that coral itself, the polyp, they have to eat it. And then the coral gives them a home. The coral breaks down their, their byproducts and feeds it back to the zoanthellae. So they kind of live in this happy little relationship here. 
And it's called a symbiosis. All right, so a symbiosis is when two or more organisms live together in this really tight-knit relationship, and they kind of can't live with one without one another kind of thing. All right, so what type of relationship would they be? So they're endosymbionts. Endo, because they're indoors, they live inside their cells. There is exosymbionts. But these are endosymbionts, and there's three kinds of endosymbiotic relationships. You could be parasitic, like a parasite where one organism is happy and one organism is hurt, right? Like a parasite hurts you, like worms on a dog or unfortunately humans. All right, mutualism, where both organisms are happy, both benefit in some way, whether it just be like they give them a nice little house or they provide them with food or oxygen or whatever it is, they both have benefits. Or commensalism, where one is benefited and the other just kind of nothing. There's no help. There's no hurt. It's just there. So there's three types of relationships. What do you think the zoan and the uh, coral are? Are they parasites, mutualistic, or commensalism? Mutualistic, because they're both benefiting, right? All right, so corals are under a second threat that's also caused by carbon dioxide, but it's a little different. So a lot of kids get these mixed up, and I want to make sure that you do not get them mixed up. All right, so coral bleaching is the second threat. It is caused by carbon dioxide, but not in the same way. When you increase carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, yes, it's going to dissolve in the oceans, and yes, it's going to cause ocean acidification. But the second thing it does, probably uh, the worst thing for us right now, is it causes this global climate change, doesn't it? Because it is a greenhouse gas, it holds the heat in from our sun and doesn't let it radiate off of the planet. It holds it here. So what happens is not only is the planet warming, but the oceans are warming too. And when the ocean warms, you're kind of doing a one-two punch to coral. Not only are you dissolving it from ocean acidification, but now you're killing the zoans. When a coral gets hot in warm water, they expel all of the zoanthellae out of their tissues. Now the zoanthellae are the colorful parts of them, so they look like this. When the water's too warm, they undergo what's called a bleaching event. And that bleaching event will make them, they're not really pouring bleach in the water. That has nothing to do with it. It's just called that because it turns it white. That's all. All right, but then they're undergoing a bleaching event. What's happening is the zoanthellae are leaving. They're gone. Well, the zoanthellae fed all the polyps. So what's going to happen over time? It's going to happen if you're not getting food. You're going to die. You're going to starve, right? And that's what happens here. These guys will starve. Can they survive? If the water cools back down within two weeks, the zoanthellae will come back into this coral and they can survive. But what happens is they're left with, they're not very healthy. They're very sick at that point. So they still might die. As long as the temperature cools back off in the water, it can do this. Um, this is actually the NOAA. And I want you to go to this website. It's a really cool website. And this is the actual bleaching right now happening on the planet, right now. The 90% chance that they are bleaching currently at this moment. And those are the darker the red, the worse it is. That means that 90% chance within the next two weeks, these will all bleach. That's huge. That's a huge amount of corals. These down here, the next one, those are 60% chance that they're going to bleach. That's almost every coral reef on the planet. And it's February or March. It's March now. 
All right, so if you're looking at these, heat stress is the issue. This is all the coral reefs, the last one here, that is at watch level or higher. That's crazy, isn't it? Every single coral reef on the planet, except for deep water reefs, is under a major threat. And even the deep water, some of them are, because of the increasing of the temperatures of the sea. The sea temperatures are crazy. If you look at the Caribbean, these are the ones here. We have a we have a bleaching event going on right now in Jacksonville. Right to today. Because the waters are too warm. Which is crazy. It's March. Wrong one. Oops. Exit. This one. All right, so these coral bleaching events, you're going to need to know what causes them. So you have healthy coral. They depend on the zoan algae. They stress. If they're stressed, they zoan leave the algae plant. As long as they come back within two weeks, they're okay. If they don't, then they wind up starving to death. So the coral is left bleach, very vulnerable to disease, lots of issues here. We have a, um, we have a lab on coral bleaching and a lab on ocean acidification coming up. So this is what it looks like. The exact same place was photographed before a bleaching event and then after. Take a look at the fish. You see that blue fish? From far away, can't you? What's gonna happen to every single little fish from living in the ocean? And I'm that obvious, what's gonna happen to me? He's gonna get eaten, he's gonna die, isn't he? So it's not just a coral problem, it's also, it's all of their homes. They're colorful because in the colored coral, you can't see them. You certainly can when they're bleached. They pop out like a sore thumb. So they'll wind up dying as well. And it's one of the biggest threats to the coral reef. You've got 60% of the world's coral is expected to be lost by 2030. If you want to go to coral reef diving, you better go soon. Because all of these reefs are under threat and all of them are bleaching and all of them are going through ocean acidification. And ocean acidification is a slower process, but bleaching is fast. Within two weeks, they could die. And a massive number would die. All the coral in an area would die, not just a little bit. All right, so corals are losing these zoanthellae due to the temperature difference. And the temperatures are rising because of all of the CO2. And there will not be any coral reefs for your children, almost guaranteed. You need to go see them. All right, so you need to be able to compare and contrast these two processes. You need to be able to compare and contrast coral bleaching and ocean acidification. They are not the same, but they are ultimately caused from the same reason that's atmospheric carbon dioxide increase. They're all human caused. We did this. It causes a massive decrease in biodiversity, massive. All right, so you need to be aware of all of these changes. We're going to talk about jellyfish next class.